Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, CyberVista is very honored to be here at Faircon and to introduce this session. Our work in aligning our board and executive level cyber risk training courses with FAIR certainly helps get you and your organization to the next level in reporting to your board. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Omar Kowaja. Omar is the CISO at Highmark Health, where he heads both information security and the informa information risk program, and is an adjunct faculty member of the CISO program here at CMU. Omar is in the process of building his risk management program <clears throat> based on FAIR, but in this session, he will uh, focus on the topic of reporting cyber risk to the board. He will explain to us what why what used to work in the board reporting may no longer work and what it takes to align yourself with the business and the board. So please join me in welcoming Omar to the stage. Okay, thank you everyone. So um, I'm gonna speak to you a little bit about uh, speaking to the board and as I walk through my presentation and even as I was thinking about what to present when I was um, asked, to, asked to speak on this topic, it was, it was a difficult, this is a difficult one to give an answer on. So if you're expecting, here's a set of slides that you can use to now go present to the board, or here's a set of stories that you can go tell the board and you'll leave with bags of money. Um, unfortunately, there is no answer, answer like that. And I, I say that simply because as I think about my own journey, what I needed to share with the board and what I needed to, to say to the board and what I needed to get from the board has changed and it's evolved pretty significantly over the last five years that I've been at, um, at Highmark Health. So there is no one answer. It really depends on your journey. So unfortunately, that means that um, I'm going to make this conversation slightly more philosophical. I'm going to give you some of the ways of thinking about things. I'll share with you my journey, where I was, and where I am now. And you know, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's just what is the right answer for um, what is appropriate given where you are with your board and, and on that journey. And hopefully, I'll give you an idea, idea of that. But before I, um, before I begin, um, is there anything specific any of you are looking to get out of today's session? I can't see anyone, so raise your hand or not raise your hand, just start speaking. Okay, that's good. Everyone is here because they just wanted a place to sit. <laughs> anything anyone would like to get out of today? Good. Good question. I've got 45 minutes to come up with an answer. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, I do have a slide on that. Got it. That is a good one, and actually there's folks at CMU that are doing some pretty interesting work on that one. Thank you. Uh, everyone says keep it high level, but how high is too high for, for executives? Good question, the Marleyism. Got it. So time and um, access in terms of time and access to the board or time and access to get the work done? Got it. Good. I will address that one. That is a really, really good question, and I'm sure Cyber, Cyber Vista can help with that one as well. Yes? Good question. So what should ask the board? Okay.
Good. I, I will share some of those. And as I was reviewing the slides, I realized some of the way that I've been doing things is not very fair friendly because we've just started our fair journey in the last year or so. And the board is not where we're starting the journey. The board is going to be an important milestone as uh, we near sort of the end of uh, our journey and we, when we get to steady state. So I've just told the board about FAIR. They're really excited, but I haven't shown them any analysis or anything based on FAIR. So much of what you're going to see uh, and you look at and you're like, wow, this is the opposite of FAIR. That's right. It is the opposite of FAIR because we weren't there yet, but we're, we're, look, we're really excited to, to get to, um, get to, um, to FAIR. Okay. So um, we'll start with those. We'll make sure we, we address each of those items. I'll talk about my journey. Um, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll share with you is I've been extremely fortunate because I've had a phenomenal coach that's helped me throughout my journey with, uh, with the board, or phenomenal coaches, but probably the one that, is, uh, that, that helped me more than anyone else was um, uh, the president of the company. And so before I'd go in front of the audit committee, he would review my content. He'd send it back uh, to me. We'd go back and forth. And in the, initially, we'd probably have four or five meetings before he felt comfortable letting me go talk, to, uh, go talk to the board. But from the beginning, I was the one that was out there talking to the board. It wasn't the CIO. It was, um, it was, it was me. And I think my first board meeting was a month after I had, um, I had joined the organization. And before I even joined, they said, Omar, can you think of this? And what are you going to say to the board? I said, I, I'm not even employed by you guys. And you want me to figure out what to, what to say. This is going to be very interesting. Um, but having a great coach that can, that can sort of walk you through this, ask you those difficult questions that you're going to be asked. And one of the nicest things he would do is he'd ask me a tough question. I'd be like, I don't know. And he said, that's fine. You don't need to answer it for me. But you better have an answer when it gets asked in the boardroom. So you know, it was a very nice way of saying you need to have this, but not condescending um, in any way. So I thought that was, uh, that was very useful. The other thing that he would, uh, he would say to me, he stopped saying it because I think now he's got more confidence in me. But in the beginning, he would say, there's two rules when you go to the board. One is, don't make up anything. And two is, don't screw it up. <laughs> so that's so all you need to remember. OK, so the first question that I, I asked myself is, why am I here? And I, I have to admit that as I was sitting in the boardroom, I was, thinking this is the, I was thinking this is all about me. And part of me was thinking, I can't believe they let me into this room or at, and are expecting me to give them an update. Very soon, I realized that that was actually not the case, that I was not in the boardroom for me. I wasn't there giving an update because it had something to do with me. So the next question then became, if I'm not here for me, who am I here for? And so my initial response to that was, well, I'm really here for the board of directors because all of these folks sitting here are on the board. And my job is to give them an update. But soon I realized it wasn't even, it wasn't really just for the board either. Over time, I realized that yes, while I was focused on the board members that were in the room, the presidents of almost every single business unit that we had were also there. Our, legal, our head of legal was there. Our head of compliance was there. Uh, our chief risk officer was there. There's a lot of senior people in that room. And so when I'm there, I'm not just talking to and providing an update to the board. I'm actually talking to and providing an update to a variety of stakeholders, the board being um, and the board members being a very important one of, of, those, um, of those stakeholders in the room. What was my objective? I'll be honest with you. I had no idea. I was just like, they want me to come in here, give them an update. I'll put a bunch of slides together, talk about like the risks, because everyone says, go talk about risks. So I'll talk about what the risks are. I'll talk about what we're doing. And then I'll leave. Like I was focused on the content. I wasn't focused on what my objective was, because I can admit this now, probably for the first two years that I was providing updates to the board, I had really no idea what I was there for and what my objective was. Was I trying to get something out of it? Was the board trying to get something out of it? Was the CEO trying to get something out of it? Was the president of my business unit using this to make him look good? It was, it was kind of confusing to me why I was there, but I just managed to stumble through it and 
not screw anything up and um, not make up anything while I was doing it. But over time, you realize that it is for governance and it is for, for oversight. And when you think of governance and you think of oversight, those are, those are terms that are used and, and sometimes overused and they can mean many things. And one quote that I heard about, um, about boards is, the job of a board is to govern. It is not to manage. The job of management, which I am a part of and the CEO is a part of and the head of compliance and the head of risk and everyone else in the room that's not a board member is a part of, the job of management is to manage and run the organization. It is not the job of the board to run the organization. It is their job to govern. And probably the single best quote I've heard to describe that is said the job of a board is to get their hands around an organization, but to do so without getting any of their fingers into it. Right, so how does the board do that? And then how do you make sure that the board is fulfilling its responsibilities in having governance over, in this case, cyber risks as it relates to the Highmark Health enterprise. And so in this case, um, one, one thing I realized is I'm not, there to, I'm not there to ask for money. Because in our case, the way that our board works is we truly follow that precept of the board does not run the company. The board provides governance. They make sure we don't go off the rails. They remind us of what our core mission is. But they don't make, they don't make our day-to-day -day decisions for us. They don't set our day-to-day -day priorities. They're not involved in hiring and firing of individuals. Um, but things that affect the entire enterprise and are standing within the organization, within the community, that is something that they absolutely do care about and they do want to achieve. And so um, in our case, the board does not approve any of my funding. In fact, the board, I don't even tell the board how many people I have on my team and I haven't even told the board what my budget is. Um, until last week at the board meeting, um, we were going through the um, we we're going through the NACD five principles for cyber risk management, and that answers one of the questions or a couple of the questions you guys asked is, um, what best practices do we follow? Well, as I was building relationships with the board members, I realized that they think of the National Association of Corporate Directors, the NACD, as the foremost authoritative source. So if I went to them and said, this is what high trust says, or if I went to them and said, this is what NIST says, or if I went to them and said, this is what SCI says, or some others, they'd be like, why do we care? We don't even know who they are. And so the only way that you can deliver a convincing message is when you pick an authoritative source that is authoritative to your audience, not to me. And so if I want to tell the audience about FAIR, I've got to build up FAIR, I've got to demonstrate to them why they should care. It's going to take me some time to get there and I'll spend the next six or nine months getting there, but the board already knows who the NACD is. And if I want to tell the board how to manage me and my program, or rather how to provide oversight for me, how to provide oversight for my program, the place I'm going to go is NACD because that is who they consider to be their authoritative source. And it turns out the NACD, in partnership with Carnegie Mellon has done a lot of work on cyber and they produce what I think is probably one of, the, one of the top five white papers I've seen on cyber on any topic. And um, it's about the five key, cyber, five key principles as it relates to uh, boards providing oversight of, um, of cyber programs. And so I said, fine, I'm just going to take that and I'm gonna provide updates based on those five cyber principles and if I do that instead of waiting for the board to figure out how to provide oversight of me and if I wait for them to figure it out guess what they will likely make mistakes along the way they will likely try to put fingers in their program they will likely do things that they shouldn't be doing and that I may not like and so it's much easier for me to be proactive and tell them how they should fulfill their responsibility instead of me waiting for them to figure it out. So one of the objectives then is, I wanna make sure that the board fulfills their responsibility. The board is very interested in things like insurance. Why? Because when something goes wrong, do we have insurance to cover it? Because all of this security mumbo jumbo, they have no idea if it's good enough or if it's not good enough, but they understand insurance. How much are we buying insurance for? Oh, it's that many hundreds of millions of dollars? Okay, we can rest assured. So in the earlier years of the program, every single update I would give, they would just want to talk about cyber insurance. Because the security stuff, they don't get, they shouldn't be expected to get, 
but the insurance stuff they got and they wanted to make sure they had that insurance and they were also very interested in how about us personally what is our liability personally they want to make sure that they're fulfilling their responsibility because that's important to them they want to make sure that the minutes in the board meeting reflect the nature of the discussion they want to make sure that the charter of the audit committee accurately reflects the work that is being done and we talk about that probably once or twice sometimes as many as three times a year because they want to make sure that they're at least doing the things that they need to do to be able to provide that governance and to be able to provide that oversight and so then you know, I used to think that the board's role was about accountability and it was about approval. And I even used to think that the board is going to give me some direction and they're going to tell me what I need to do. And I need to go buy a next gen firewall and I need to go do more pen tests. I was thinking they would give me some of that. It turns out that they didn't. And part of it was because I was either, you know, blessed or maybe not blessed. You could look at it either way that my board wasn't very technical they weren't very cyber savvy. They weren't asking me a lot of those questions. And by the time we actually added a member to the board who came from a very large prominent bank, and he had gone through many of these discussions for prior years at when he was at that bank, then he brought in many of the same learnings and the findings and the questions that he had heard and the updates that he had seen at that very large, um, at very large bank. And then we started to get into technical discussions. And when I did my one-on-one -on -one with him, I was like, wow, this guy's really asking me some hard questions. And it got me very excited. Because I did want someone to challenge me. I do want someone to give me some ideas. I do want someone to give me thoughts. I don't want to just go into the boardroom and say, I have helped you fulfill your responsibility. Life is good. I'm just going to come in, tell some good stories, and I'm going to leave, and I'll keep coming back and doing that. That's good. I absolutely want to make sure that the board is fulfilling their responsibility and providing that oversight and not telling me as much what to do. But I love feedback. I want people to tell me how we can make our program better. And if I've got someone on the board that's knowledgeable and that's going to ask some good questions, it's very, very useful. The other thing that I learned, and I, I had you know, someone told me this. They said, Omar, remember, the members of the board are extremely smart people. If they weren't, they would not be in that position. However, they don't understand security. So it's easy to draw the conclusion that these guys are a bunch of idiots because they don't know the difference between endpoint and network DLP. But that's not their job. They don't need to know that. They don't need to understand that. So if I am speaking at too detailed a level and it goes over their head, it's not their fault for being stupid. It's my fault for not communicating to my audience in a way that they actually get and in a way that they actually understand. Um, one of the gentlemen asked the question about what level is appropriate to speak to at the board. Um, you know, the, this is the same question, the same answer, the answer to this question would be the same as what level, at what level do you, should you speak to your child? What's the answer to that question? At their level. Does their level change? Yes. yes. Why does their level change? Because they're growing. They're learning. They're having experiences. They're going to school. They have teachers. They have friends. They have neighbors. They're watching something. And their level changes. So if I speak to my five-year-old or my eight-year-old at the level that I speak to my five-year-old, she's going to be like, Baba, what are you doing? Stop talking to me like I'm a kid. I'm like, you are a kid, but different story. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's important. And guess what my job is and our job is when we're reporting to the board? Is it to help them? learn? Is it to help them grow? Is it to help them get more savvy on cyber? Absolutely. Now, do I go in there and give them a primer on the 14 different types of controls that we have on our perimeter and expect them to understand all of those technologies and why we need 14 of them? No, that's not what they need. But am I making them savvier as to what our risks are and what the trends are and what the bad guys are doing and why they're doing it and what the good guys are doing and what we should be prepared for when we're doing an M&A or we're growing something or we're doing a marketing campaign? Absolutely, I should. And as I grow them, their level becomes higher. And then what I can deliver to them and the conversation can start to be at that 
Um, now I've got my highs and lows confused. But as I grow them and they get savvier and they understand cyber more and they understand risk more and they understand the program more, I can then start to talk to them about more details. But I have to take them along that journey. If I start teaching calculus to my eight-year-old, I will think that she's dumb because she doesn't get calculus. But if she's gone through everything else and the prerequisites and by the time we get to calculus, then that will be the right thing for her to learn and hopefully she'll do, that, um, she'll do that really, really well. So very important that you are growing them and that you're evolving them and that you're teaching them. So when I do my updates for the board, I, I basically have a few agenda items and the agenda items, the topics stay exactly the same. The first thing I talk about is I give them an update on the cyber threat landscape, which is what's happening not within Highmark, but what's happening somewhere in the world that is relevant for them to know about. The second thing I share with them is, what have we done at Highmark to reduce our risk? The third thing I talk to them about is, what is the current state of risk in our environment? And you know, we've got different ways of talking about that and depicting that, and, and we'll see that in a few slides here. But those are really the only three topics I have for the board. What's happening in the world? What did we do to make things better? And where are we now? That's it. OK. So um, knowing your audience becomes really, really important. So every time we have a new board member, I now have a practice of having a one-on-one -on -one with that board member. Because guess what? They haven't been part of our journey. The rest of the board has been part of this journey. They've been learning. I've been, they've been asking questions. They've been figuring things out. But if someone is new, they have no idea where we came from. They have no idea where we are. And they're possibly going to start by asking questions that aren't really going to be productive because everyone's already heard the answers to them. Or you know, there's either two types. One is the type that will ask those questions and force things to go backwards. And the other board member type is probably the slightly more responsible, self-aware one that will say, you know what? These are basic questions. I can't ask them in this, in this session. And so they won't ask. And it'll take them two years to finally play catch up. And I just don't want to do that. I don't think either of those outcomes are good. So then the way I address it is, I've got a short presentation I use with the board members to say, here's what's been going on, and here's where we are today. Guess what? That presentation is exactly the same as the presentation we give to every single new hire that joins the information security organization. Because the story is the same. There's no two stories. So the story we give to the analyst that's starting in the SOC is the exact same story we give to the new board member that's joining our board. And we've now published it in a nice brochure. And we can flip through it. And we could say, this is where we were. We believe in continuous improvement. This is how we've been improving. This is where we are. This is how we measure it. Here's our guiding principles. And now they've probably gotten 60% you know, of what they would have learned over the course of two years had they been sitting in those boardroom presentations. Knowing your audience is extremely important. Because if you don't know your audience, you're not going to be able to connect with them. How many of you have kids? Right? When you put your kids in school, when you put your kids in preschool, did you care about the student-teacher ratio? Why? Because you want, if the ratio is really, really large, is your teacher going to get to know your student? Absolutely not. And so we care about small ratios primarily because we think there, we give a very high level of importance to the fact that if, my te if the teacher knows my kid, my kid is going to have a significantly better learning experience as a result. And so building that relationship is key. Having that knowledge, understanding each board member one-on-one -on -one is helpful. Now, is it possible? Is it practical? No. Do I have a relationship with everyone on the board? No. Do I have a relationship with several people on the board? Do I have a relationship with several people that are in the executive committee that are sitting in there? Yeah, I do. But I've taken that time to build that relationship. The other thing is, the fastest way to build a relationship with someone is to be able to empathize with them, to be able to put yourself in their shoes. And so when I started this, I was not a board member. I was going and speaking to the board and anxious and nervous every single time I did that, thinking this might be the time that I actually do screw it up. Um, but the other thing I did is I ended up joining a board. And I said, I wonder what it feels like to be a board member. 
to have that sense of responsibility, but not to have that control, not to have that visibility, to just get an hour or so or two hours with management every quarter and feel like I'm still fulfilling my responsibility. What other avenues would I seek out? What would my instincts dictate I do in that situation? Well, then I just need to flip it and say, can I make that available to the board? Can I use it to build better relationships and get to know them? And one of the best ways I've found to do that is for me to join other boards to see how other boards function. How do I persuade the board? Ultimately, you know, the goal of going to the board is you're trying to persuade them of something. In your case, it may be you're trying to persuade them to give you more money. In your case, it may be to persuade them that things really suck and the sky is falling. In some cases, it may be to persuade them that life is good and you guys should stop worrying and maybe take me off the agenda next time. Right? But there's got to be something that you're trying to persuade them of, and that sort of becomes your objective. Or your objective could simply be, I'm trying to persuade you that you are doing everything you need to do to effectively fulfill your responsibilities. And if you're trying to understand what your responsibilities are, here are the NACD5 principles. How do I persuade them that they're doing that? Well, for the last four board meetings, I've picked one of those NACD principles and reviewed each one of those. And so I've got one more, one more to do, and we'll be done with all five. And then I said as a follow-up, that document has 37 questions in the appendix. I'm going to provide an answer to each of those, each of those questions, one slide, per, per, um, uh, one slide response per question. We'll have a document that will be our FAQ. Any board member that starts, that will now be a phenomenal reference guide that we can give to them to say, if you want to know what's going on with cyber at Highmark Health, why don't you start by reading this 38-page document, 37 questions plus one title slide. Um, start with this, and you'll have what you need. You have any more questions, would love to respond to those in a one-on-one, -on -one, spend more time with you, get you to where, where you need to be. So it was all about logic. It was all about, can I give you data? Can I give you facts? Can I give you stats? Can I give you more data? Can I give you more facts? Can I tell you numbers, numbers, numbers? Because I'm type A. Um, my undergrad degree is in electrical engineering, and that's what came really, really natural to me. What Aristotle said is the way that you persuade is using three things. Most of you probably know this. Logos is certainly one of them, which is all about logic and the appeal to logic and, and numbers and, and stats. But that's what I found is that was not sufficient. There was only so much I was able to do by just focusing on logos and limiting myself to just one of the three types of persuasion. And so then I said, I want, to do, I want to do pathos. Pathos is the appeal to emotion. And emotion is really actually easy in our world because all you have to do is tell a story. And to tell a story, you just have to pick up the last headline from um, the last breach. And you can talk about what bad stuff happens. Now, you know, we're starting to enter into the territory of FUD, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And, we have plenty of vendors that come to us and say, if you don't buy our product, you will be like this headline. And we don't like it, so I didn't want to be that person on the other side promoting this. And so I do tell stories, and I tell stories primarily because it started off with, I didn't want to tell those stories because I thought those stories aren't necessarily, the conclusions that you draw, we draw from the stories, more often than not, tend to be incorrect. And we pick the things that we want to from the stories, and we draw those conclusions. And it just didn't feel right for me, to, for me to do that and play those games. But what I found is every time I'd go to the board, they'd ask me about the recent headline. They'd ask me about Equifax, or they'd ask me about Sony, or Target, or Home Depot, or UPMC, or whatever breach had happened. And they'd want to spend 20, 30 minutes just hearing about it. So initially, I, sometimes I'd be prepared, sometimes I wouldn't. And then I said, you know, they're going to ask me this anyway. I might as well put this in the presentation. And they loved hearing about the stories. And I realized over time, that was a great way for me to educate them and update them. But I had to be very purposeful in picking the stories. I didn't want to just pick any story. I wanted to pick a story that was remarkable, that was worth remarking on. So recently, last week, I picked a story where an organization um, uh, the world knew about their data breach because it was filed in their 8K. I also picked that story because they contained the breach within 50 minutes, which I think is phenomenal. And yet in 50 minutes, there were 7,000 devices that got breached. I picked that because I want them to know if we do have an incident, 
even if we're phenomenal at containing it, and the results are we have 7,000 systems that are breached, they're not going to look at this and say, Omar, your team sucks. They're going to look at this and say, wait a minute, I remember you shared that once. And I remember you explained to us the velocity with which these things can spread. And so I use stories to educate. I use stories to get them emotionally vested for them to understand how important this stuff is. The last one, which is the toughest one, is ethos. Ethos is about your ethics. Ethos is about credibility. Remember the two comments, uh, pieces of advice that my president gave me? One was don't screw it up. The other one was don't make stuff up. That goes straight to ethos. And ethos is something that you don't just come with. Ethos is something that you have to build, you have to establish. And there's no way I had any ethos with that board or with any board in my first six months or my first year, first year and a half. It probably took me about two years to get to the point where the board said, if it's coming from Omar, we can trust it. If it's coming from Omar, we know that this has to be right because it's well researched, it's well thought out, and it is, it is believable. And one of the ways to be believable is how you answer questions. I used to answer questions by simply reacting to them and coming up with the single best answer I could come up with. But over time, what you realize is there's a huge difference between reacting and responding. And over time, as you, the only way that you can be responsive instead of reactive is if you're prepared. And you can only be prepared if you can anticipate. And you can anticipate. Um, and so that's what I started to do, is I started to anticipate. I started to respond. I started to think through things. It wasn't, you know, Omar, what are you doing about this? Oh, that's a good question. Let me, um, let me think about that. And uh, yeah, I guess we would do this, and we'd upgrade that, and on and on. And it was always in the future tense. Being responsive means it's not all in the future tense. It's good question. Here's what we've already done to address that. Here's some of the other things we're thinking about. And anticipate is you're not going to even ask me the question because I'm going to answer it before you ask. And so the example I gave with the NACD five principles is I didn't wait for them to figure out what their responsibility is. I told them. I anticipated it. I told them what it was. And I answered it even before they could ask that question. And probably one of the single best tools that I have in my arsenal that gives me confidence going into the boardroom, or for that matter, any executive presentation, is I know that I'm going to be able to say, I don't know. And I'm going to say it with confidence. And when you get to the point where you can get in front of any audience and say, I don't know with confidence, guess what? You're no longer nervous. The thing that makes us nervous is, what if they ask me a question and I don't know how to answer it? Well, now you've got an easy out. You just say, I don't know, and you're done. But you can only do that once you've built the ethos and once you've built the credibility. And obviously, you can't answer that, answer it with, I don't know, very often. And initially, when I was getting those tough questions I didn't know the answer to, I was definitely fumbling my way through it. And I'd leave those boardrooms, sit in the cafeteria, because I didn't want to be in my office. I didn't want to be interrupted. And I'd just take a piece of paper, and I'd write down my answers. And I'd be thinking, what the hell was I thinking? That was a horrible answer. I did not build any ethos. I did not build any credibility. But if I took the time to answer it, what would my response look like? And I practiced that, and I practiced that, and I practiced that, and I practiced my I don't knows. And the other thing I realized is the follow-up is what matters. People will forget all of your I don't knows. They will all be erased. In fact, your I don't knows will actually end up building your ethos if you do one thing, which is follow up. So if you take that question that you didn't have an adequate response to or you had no response to and you make sure you follow up the next time, that's going to build credibility because they know that when this guy comes in and he doesn't know the answer, he comes back next time and provides us the answer, even if no one asks for it. Or I'll stick it if it's a very long answer. I'll say, you know, the last time someone asked about how we're determining, um, how we're prioritizing which systems to patch first versus later, we've got this extensive heat map, lots of detail, stuck it in the appendix, started the conversation with, hey, the answer to that question is in the appendix. If anyone wants more detail, um, you know, I'd be happy to discuss it with you one on one. OK. Are we getting better? This is probably you know, one of the questions that I guess to ask more and more often. And in the past, the only thing I would really show is a point of view image. Here is where we are today. Well, more than here is where we are today, well, tell me, are we getting better? 
That's the thing leaders always want to know. How do we know that we are actually getting better? So this is you know, one of the charts that I show of the security program and how it's evolved. And guess what? You can't read a single word in any of those, uh, in most of those charts, but do you think the program's getting better? Right. So I'm not expecting them to be technical. So someone mentioned how high level, how low level. This is how you should respond. Now I could have provided that same information in bullet points. If I provided that information in bullet points, guess what? They would have to be security experts to be able to digest it. Took that same information, made it a visual. It takes them five seconds to look at it and they say, yeah, I guess the program's getting better. Because I see more boxes, I see less white space, and I see a bunch of certifications, which I guess must mean something. I do remember the audit team talking about um, SOC 2, and I do remember something about high trust, so I guess they got something with high trust in SOC 2. Again, they don't have to know anything about what SOC 2 is, what high trust is, what each of those boxes are. They just know that we are getting better. But the next question then becomes, great, we're getting better, but how do we know that's enough? Right? My four-year-old and five-year-old and six-year-old, they're growing every year, which is good news, but how do I know if they're growing enough? Well, the pediatrician says everyone is on their own growth curve. So we compare everyone to their growth curve and we decide, are they growing enough? Or are they not growing enough? And in the past, we would provide a comparison to no one. And then we said, okay, maybe we can at least provide a comparison to ourselves, but better yet, can we provide a comparison to a benchmark? So some of the slides that Jack Jones showed this morning are really, really good data. If you're one of those companies that took that survey, it would be invaluable for you to say against that, against that histogram showing where the various companies are when it comes to their maturity in the way that they manage and talk about risk, where do you fall? Where did you fall a year ago and two years ago and where are you gonna be in the future? To be able to demonstrate and convey that would instill a significant amount of credibility. Again, you know, when we started the presentation, it started with me because I thought that's why I was there. And as I got further in my journey and I was thinking about who do I represent, I used to think that I am there representing me. Okay, maybe it's not just me, but I am there as a representative of the security program. So I could have one of my directors come in and give the presentation and they could represent the security program as well. But over the last maybe year or so, I've realized I am actually not there as a representative of the security program. And that occurred to me because as I looked at many of the questions that were asked and the key principles in the NACD, it became clear to me, none of those questions said, what is the CISO doing? None of those questions said, is the security department doing X or Y or Z? They all talked about what is the organization doing? And so I realized if I'm up there responding to those questions and they've sort of defined, identified me as the person responsible for the security program, then I am there not just representing the security program, I am actually representing all of management. And so if I am representing all of management and I know that the security program isn't just a list of services that come out of the security department, it's, it's a, whole lot, um, a whole lot more than, more than just that, then who am I representing? Well, I'm also representing the chief risk officer because he's got a stake in it. I'm also representing the chief compliance officer because she's got a stake in it. I'm also representing the chief privacy officer because she's got a stake in it. I'm representing the president of the business unit and I'm also representing the CEO of the entire company. And how do I make sure that they're prepared? How do I make sure they're not blindsided? How do I make sure that when I go in and I give my updates that we all are aligned because it just isn't me giving an update, it is me giving an update on behalf of management, on behalf of the entire organization to this body of, um, to this body of stakeholders. And I could tell you the single best response that I can have in the boardroom to any question that gets asked is this. Nothing. Do you know how I get to do that? It's when someone else answers for me. And that is really, really, really important because half of the NACD questions around the board's responsibility are all about, is this enterprise wide? Is there the right collaboration? Did we just pick one person and expect them to manage cyber risk for a large multi-billion dollar enterprise? That's not possible. But if the questions get asked 
And I look at Dennis, who's our chief risk officer, and he's going to be on a panel, I think, tomorrow. Should come listen to him. I'm like, that's great. I would much rather Dennis answer that question. And if I can look at Chuck, who's our head of audit, and he can answer the question, I'd much rather they do that. And if David Holmberg, our CEO, can step in and provide an answer, I'm more than happy. So every time I get a question, the first thing I do is I pause and I look around the room to see if anybody else wants to answer the question, my preference is let them answer it. Because now I'm demonstrating to them that this is an enterprise-wide program. I could show them any possible number of pretty PowerPoint charts, but I want them to feel it. I want them to experience it. So pathos versus logos. How does the board feel? Um, in the beginning, they would, think, they would say things like, I'm really worried. Um, and I would say, well, if you're worried, you feel like you've got no control over it. And so over time, they started to say things like, I'm concerned. I'm like, OK, that makes me feel a little bit better. But when you say you're worried, that makes me feel like you've just given me a failing grade on my job. Because my job is to make sure you don't have to worry because I'm doing all the worrying. I should be staying up at night worrying about this because that's what you pay me for. I'm the designee to make sure that we've got the right program in place. Um, so I left that board meeting when I heard a board member say, Omar, thanks for sharing all of this. We're really worried. So you definitely made your point. And I'm like, no, guys. That wasn't the point. The point isn't to get you guys to be worried. The point is to make you feel like this is being managed. Yes, this problem is hard. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's getting worse. But guess what? Management has a handle on it. They're managing it. They know what's coming. They know what to do. They're applying the right resources, right level of urgency, right level of collaboration, set the bar high. These guys know what they're doing. This feels managed. So um, this is one of the, I'm glad Nick stepped out for this one. Um, <laughs> But this is one of the slides that I share on what's our level of risk. So one of our business units, we said, OK, there's nine critical risks. And we just want you to show you quarter over quarter, year over year, are the risks bet getting better or are they getting worse? And this was fine, because this helped them understand in a very clear and simple way where things are getting. So there's no, there's no technology mentioned in there. There's no acronyms in there. OK, I'm going to change the slide since Nick will be here any day, any minute. OK. Um, the, um, the next thing, the hot topic, of, I think everyone's always interested in, in metrics. And so my view was, you know, we've got a lot to measure. And as I would get dig deeper and deeper into the program, it felt like we needed to have 127 metrics. And they had to be comprehensive. And they had to be technical. And if the board didn't get it, they were just dumb. And we needed to replace them with smarter board members. And it was all their fault. But by golly, I was going to give them all of the right metrics. And then I realized, why? Like, all they need to know is, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? How much better? How much worse? How are we doing compared to others? And so to convey that, they don't need to know about every single corner and every single inch of the security program. They just need to have enough relevant and representative metrics to demonstrate, are we headed in the right direction? Are we not headed in the right direction? Um, and so we came up with something called the Secure Index which stands for six different things that we measure, safeguarding endpoints, eliminating vulnerabilities, controlling assets, user access, responding to incidents, and event monitoring. We said these are the six things that feel like the right balance between the technical folks will get it and say this is important, the business folks and the board will get this. And this was you know, probably about two years into our journey that we finally introduced them to this. And we said this will make sense. Prior to this, just to give you an idea of of how off base I was, I had, and I'm not even kidding, there's people on my team that can validate this, um, we had 25 slides of metrics that were in the appendix. Every single board meeting. And you know, luckily, I built some relationships, so they were nice to me. But after a while of sharing all of these long list of um, metrics, uh, a couple of the board members came to me and said, Omar, you know, these metrics are really, really good, really powerful. Um, I bet, you know, didn't read any of them, but, and he said, but it would be nice if you could somehow like boil them down to one slide. I said, really? But these are 20. 20 slides feels 19 better than just one. He said, you know, just one slide would be better. And so we worked at it, worked at it, worked at it. And um, this is the slide that we then show is for those six. What are the things that we're measuring? What's the monthly value? 
what's the score, what's the trend, and then we also have a chart that looks like a stock ticker price that shows where's the score going. Um, one of the things that the board member said, a couple board members raised just last week, they said, Omar, um, with some of these charts, it looks like you're doing a great job. All of these reds are turning into yellows, and those yellows are turning into greens, and um, what does, does that mean things are getting better, but this other stuff you're telling us about the threat landscape makes it seem like things are getting worse, and so are, are we maybe sugarcoating some of this stuff? Is this really getting better, or is it getting worse? And so I said, great question. This is how we're going to address it. So the secure index, there's no industry measure for something like this. And if there was, you know, that would be good. But there isn't, so we had to come up with our own. So there's no way to compare ourselves to other programs. Um, but I said, at the end of every year, our goal is to be on a scale of 1 to 5, at least to be at about a 4. And we'll be there at the end of this year. On January 1 of 2019, we're going to reset the scoring. And that 4 will automatically go down to maybe a 2 or 2.5. Two and then we'll spend the year trying to make our way back up. So we'll end the year probably all green, as long as we meet the expectations we set. But then we'll start the, red, the green, the, the, we'll start the year all red. And so they heard that and they said, that sounds right. Because it is, you know, the analogy I use with my team is when you come to work every single day, you should pretend like you're walking up an escalator. The only problem with this escalator is you're trying to go up, but the escalator's headed down. So no matter, how, if we stand still, we will literally end up on the previous floor. So we've got to make sure we're trying harder and harder. And one way of doing that and making sure we're getting the continuous improvement is by taking that bar and physically setting it higher and higher every year, which means our scores are going to get worse at the beginning of every year. Um, here's another one that I wanted to share, because I know metrics are a big topic. Uh, in our program, we actually use something called a balanced scorecard. You read this from top to bottom. Starts with the people. If you have the right people culture, you have the right processes. If you have the right processes, then your customers are happy. And if your customers are happy, then your business and financial goals end up being met. Um, there's 26 KPIs that we measure the health of our program on. We started this journey about two and a half years ago. And there's a lot of stuff on here that has nothing to do with, is our risk higher or is our risk lower? Do you think the board cares about things like the percentage of time my team is spending on continuous improvement? They don't really care. So I share this as an example of something that I have not shared with the board. It looks pretty. It looks well thought out. I'm super proud of it. I could tell a great story. But at the end of it, the board's going to say, this is a waste of our time. Why do we care? Your job to run the program, our job to understand the risks, and is the program being run effectively or not. So this is an example of something that's way too detailed and not appropriate, at least um, in, in our context and for how our board operates, this would not be appropriate to share with, uh, with our board. OK, some key takeaways. Uh, much of what I've shared with you, I think, applies not only, to, uh, not only to communicating with the board, but in fact, communicating with any executive and probably even, even beyond that. Um, you have to align whatever you're sharing, the updates. It's got to align with the organi your organization's maturity and culture. And I can say that uh, very, that's very important because if the updates I'm sharing with the board today, I had shared those two years ago, it would be horrible. And so there has to be a time and place for what you're sharing, and it has to be aligned to the organization and to the board's maturity. If you're going to be someone that you anticipate or you currently are presenting to a board, I would strongly recommend find a board, find a nonprofit board and others in your community. Join them. They're always looking for help. And you know, having an expert like yourself on that board would be a huge asset to that organization. I would strongly recommend doing that. I know it helped me a lot. Um, iterate and show progress. Feel free to change things. Imagine if your kids went to school and every semester and every year they were showed the same thing. They'd be coming home saying, this is boring. Why am I doing this? This is a waste of my time. And you would probably end up agreeing with them. So same thing with the board. Make sure you're updating the curriculum, incrementally changing and updating, because they're getting smarter. They're getting, they're getting faster. Make sure you iterate. Make sure you show that progress. And then um, make sure that you are being humble when you go in front of the board. But at the same time, be confident. And one of the best ways to do that is to say, I don't know, with confidence. Thank you, everyone.